for studying well, how Boston well, might enact well, reparations for its black well, residents well, continues well, its work, well, one local group well, is calling well, for well, churches well, to support well, the fight for reparations. As WBZ's Paul Burton reports, they are asking for a payout in the billions. So we call on the white church in Boston to join us in supporting a black rep reparations <coughs> movement. Standing in solidarity, clergy leaders from across the city of Boston gathered for an interfaith multiracial meeting at the Resurrection Lutheran Church in Roxbury, Nubian Square. They're here to ask the religious community to atone for black Boston suffering and support black reparations. And we are coming, as Dr. King said, to get our check. Organizers from the Boston People's Reparation Commission say they're also following up on their demand on the city of Boston for a $15 billion initial payout to begin the process towards repair and reconciliation to the city's black community. $5 billion as initial payment around cash payouts, $5 billion around uh, strengthening our financial institutions, creating a new black bank, uh, $5 billion in terms of uh, addressing issues of uh, the education achievement gap between blacks and whites. In 2022, the Boston City Council and Mayor Michelle Wu offered an official apology for the city's involvement in the transatlantic slave trade. She also launched two task force research teams to study Boston's role in slavery and its long impact on descendants. So we still suffer from the trauma of those instances and even today uh, dealing with racism. On Saturday, this group called on the white church in Boston to support the black community for its association in slavery. Today we call upon this city, its financiers and its white churches to stop the shirking, stop the lying, tell the truth and pay what is owed. Organizers say the next step is to engage in conversation with white church leadership directly and find a process to help the black community. In Boston, I'm Paul Burton, WBZ News. I played that clip. <laughs> We may have to play it again just so we can kind of just take it all in. But but I guess my first question, first of all, uh, like, what is the white church of Boston? Right. I'm just the he was saying we're appealing to the white church of Bo what is the white church of Boston and what street is that located on? Like who 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 was there? at the White Church of Boston. Um, and, and and these people are asking for what? Did, did y'all hear it? I know I heard it. I just wanna make sure y'all heard it. These people are asking for, they're asking for the religious community to atone, to atone for the suffering of blacks in Boston. Now, I'm like, wait a minute, hold up, just wait a darn minute. Somebody make this make sense, because I promise you, these people are incapable of clarity of thought. And I'm not saying this to be disparaging, I'm just saying it because it is just objectively true. Now, before I begin, I was contacted today by a sister in the Lord, and I sent her an email to ask her if I could quote her. And she didn't email back to say I could quote her or at least give her name. So I'm going to quote her, but I am attributing it to um, an individual. She is one of my subscribers. And I was like, sis, I'm a, I have to, I have to quote this. It's, it's just so good. So I want to quote, I want to quote this sister in the Lord because she came, she came with the heat. She said, um, and I quote, regarding reparations, she said, reparations, it's the carrot that Democrats dug up from antiquity and threw into the black online influencer, nonprofit and legacy media to serve as the black issue and hot, emotional, irrational, hold on, talking point. Then she says, it's the carrot that certain black left-leaning political nonprofit grifters have attached to themselves in hopes to be crowned by Democrat political manipulators as the go-to black vote wrangler. I was like, damn that girl good. I was like, I think we might be related. It seemed like something I would say. 
Then she said, reparations is the issue that Democrats now need to stir Black voter enthusiasm in the wake of post-Obama disillusionment. It's the only issue. They've overplayed their hand on racism, police brutality, to the point they've had to redefine racism as abstract, unprovable microaggressions. Y'all, that's good right there. Okay, then when I say that's good, that was good. So I read that quote, that was by Clarity Speaks. And um, I was like, girl, you encapsulated everything that I wanted to say. But I have some other questions. Now that she's kind of broken down what this is really all about, I want to ask, first of all, who, who is the religious community? Like, what religion? I mean, are we talking about Christians? Are we talking about Muslims? Well, what about the Hindus? Or, or, and then you can't leave out the Roman Catholics. Or what about the spiritual folks who burn sage and worship their ancestors? Are we talking about them too? Like, I just need them to be a little bit more specific because if you're talking about having the religious community get behind this foolishness, we need to know specifically to who this clarion call is being made. At least me, because I'm like, I know they ain't talking to me. So I just... I'm trying to figure out who to talk to, but why I'm not white. So, but still, I need more specifics. Second of all, atone for the suffering of blacks in Boston. I mean, which blacks? That's what I want to know. I have so many questions. Which blacks are suffering and where are they located? Because last time I checked, this reparations conversation was rooted in slavery. So you must be, you would have to be some kind of village idiot if you think that the melanated people of Boston, Massachusetts of today are suffering trauma today as a result of the slavery in the 17th century. You have got to be kidding me. You guys, these rocket scientists who are standing up here in this press conference can't even name five slaves or five former slaves besides Booker T. Washington, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, and if you throw Nat Turner in there. Like, they ask them to name five slaves. Just five. And they will stand there looking dumber than they do right there in that video. Because no one alive today is suffering trauma as a result of slavery. If you are alive today, any trauma that you're experiencing in your own personal life as it relates to your circumstances is mostly, mostly self-inflicted. Now, all of us on a broad American scale, we're suffering and there's trauma, particularly economic trauma, right? There, there's a safety trauma we're all experiencing. We don't have nothing to do with slavery. It's just poor leadership, right? But those are, those are circumstances outside of us that we were unable to control. But if you are Black and you're dealing with an education achievement gap, as they call it, well, I say welcome to the U.S. government educational K-12 system. You are actually getting, you are receiving what that system is designed to put out. Congrats. You are among the rest of the country that is dumber today than they were, than our predecessors were 50 years ago. So we all need to be lining up for a check if that's what this is about. And are you really trying to tell us that it's because of slavery and racism that little black boys in the hood can't read? Is, is that it? Because I, I remember Booker T. Washington at nine who was in and out of school because he was busy working in a darn salt mine and in a coal mine. Somehow, somehow he managed to learn how to read so many slaves, emancipated or not. All they wanted was to know how to read. So you can't be telling me that the little black girls in the hood can't read and do math because their ancestors were enslaved. 
Is, is, is that the narrative that we're going with? Because if that's it, I, I need you to prove it. I need you to prove to me that little Joaquin Jackson living in Boston, Massachusetts, is a descendant of a slave and as a direct result of what his great, 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 great grandfather went through, then now he is struggling to read. And so he needs a check to remedy his illiteracy. That's, I, I, just saying this makes me sound real stupid. I also need you to convince me that the reason why Jamal is committing crime is because his great, 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 great grandmother, who was the head cook for a slave family, demonstrate to me how this impacted Jamal so much so that all Jamal wants to do is just, he just, he can't help it. He just got to rob, kill, and steal from people. Billion dollars and a call upon the city to all the white churches to support the black community to pay what is owed. Y'all, this is, this is, this is good. This is rich. Like, like rich and fabulous on a whole nother level. They actually convened in a room behind a mic and each one took a turn to spit this, this stir fried foolishness marinated and dumb. They all said it out loud and they weren't even embarrassed. Like they were just like, Yes, I'm, I'm the head village idiot. And yes, I follow him. I'm part of the subcommittee of village idiots. Can anyone tell me, riddle me this Batman. Y'all did a little research for this show. And um, I, I just, I need someone. Can anybody in the live chat tell me which branch of the federal government bought, traded, or own slaves. Just if you know, can somebody type the branch of government, type it down in the live chat. If you know which branch of government traded or bought or owned slaves. And I'll, I'll give you a few moments. I'm still waiting for you guys. No one has let, type it down in the chat. Come on, I'm waiting. Which branch of the federal government bought, traded, or owned slaves. Once we can determine that, I think that can help us kind of move the conversation along a little bit. But listen, but I, I, I asked you that, but now I have another question. Can someone tell me who was the top slaveholder in the United States? Type the answer in the chat if you know. And I'll wait just a bit because you guys, the answers to these questions are incredibly important. And, and, and since I am a Christian, I want to deal in truth, and I like to deal with the facts. Let's see. I have another question. The next question I want to ask you is, why? Why are you asking the white church to pay? That's the next question that I have. And the reason why I need to know on what basis is this entity that I've identified as the white church or they've identified, I first want to know who that is, like who is that? And on what basis are you determining that they need to pay? Because if we're gonna just deal with the truth, I'm a Christian, so you're not got to bring a biblical worldview on this issue. There's no such thing as the white church. There's no such thing as the black church. Like biblically, what these foolish people are asking, they are asking for support from a they that doesn't exist. And I'm going to prove it to you. Let me read you. Let me read you something really quickly. I'm reading from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let me be clear. The church is a community. 
It is a community of God's redeemed people, all who have truly trusted in Christ alone for their salvation. And the question is, how, how is the church of Jesus Christ created? I am so glad you guys are asking all of these questions. It is created by the Holy Spirit to exalt Jesus Christ as Lord of all. Well, who, who is the head of the church? What an amazing question. Christ Jesus is the head. He is savior. He is Lord and he is king of the church. You guys, the relationship between the members of the church is a result that flows from our common identity as brothers and sisters who by the spirit of adoption are added to God's holy family. So the identity of this family, you guys, it is grounded in the person and work of Christ. And therefore, it transcends any earthly distinctions of ethnicity or class or culture or gender and even nationality. So let me make it crystal clear for the people in the back. True Christian fellowship it is divinely brought about by God for the purpose of displaying and advancing God's kingdom on earth. So as Christians, we love one another and we submit to the Lordship of Jesus and him alone. So with that in view, there is ultimately only one church, the global community of believers on earth plus those who are already in glory. And for the ones that still are left here below, we take on the form of countless local churches, which simply represent a microcosm, just a smidgen, just a small little snapshot of the larger whole. So with all of that in view, explain to me, who are you trying to demand that white people White churches, specifically, support the Black community in the form of cash payments for reparations. Because I've already established that there's no such thing as the white church. So from this, who are you begging this money from? Who, who are you begging the support from? I need you to name the guilty parties. I need names and dates. Because how dare you imply that just every random person who was white and attends a church that we've not even defined is culpable for the sin that they did not commit. Because I promise you, these unrighteous tools of Satan, they don't really want to go down this road. Because if you do, you just may discover that you somewhere down the line, you two are complicit. Because we can examine the word of God on this issue. Matter of fact, let's, let's examine this for a moment. I just, Exodus 21, just real quick. Just, just a little word, you know. I, uh. um, I want to go to Exodus 21, verse 6. Uh, the Bible, you know, this whole situation was funny to me. Because these are supposed to be members of the faith community, which means they're supposed to know that there's no white church. They're supposed to know that there's no black church. Like what they're asking makes no biblical sense, but based on how they're dressed and looking at this hodgepodge group of misfits, I can already kind of tell that they don't have a biblical worldview. Like they always give signs and clues as to the kingdom that they represent. And it's not the kingdom of light. I'm just saying, we can go back and take a look. You'd be like, yeah, I already know. I already know the type of people we dealing with, right? But Exodus 21, verse 16, whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. Hmm, that's interesting how the, Bible just puts that down. Like he who kidnaps a man and whether he sells him or he finds is found in his possession, like this was punishable by death. And then we have Deuteronomy 24. Let me just get there real quickly. I know y'all are so used to these YouTubers with their little digital Laga software. I need me a good old, old I, I got, you hear that? You hear them pages? I need the pages. I got to hear it. Got to hear the pages. 
I feel connected to the word when I can see the black letters on the white pages. It's something about the unity of that that just does it for me. But anyway, verse number seven says of Deuteronomy 24, if a man is found stealing one of his brothers of the people of Israel, and if he treats him as a slave or sells him, then that thief shall die. So you shall purge the evil from your miss basically a man so exodus wasn't specific to any particular people group and then deuteronomy here is saying whether you steal in a regular gentile or an israelite it is it is still wrong so kidnapping and enforced slavery are forbidden and punishable by death according to the scripture this was true for any man Exodus 21 dealt with just any man and then Deuteronomy 24 as well. It was applicable for the Israelites. So not only that, if you're now all of a sudden, if you now want to indict the white church for slavery and then demand payment from them, what are you doing? I don't think they thought this through because I'm like, what, what you going to do? about the Native Americans who also owned their own little stockpile of slaves. Huh? How are you going to... Oh, yeah, you didn't think... You didn't, I bet you didn't think about that, did you? No, you didn't think about that because they didn't teach you that in your little government school. But us, the not-so-smart regular people over here, if you just did a little research, like Mayor Wu, your little research team, they didn't tell you about that part. They didn't tell you? No? My question is, who paid for this research team? Mayor Wu, the mayor of Massachusetts, Boston, Massachusetts, someone had to pay this research team who studied all of this. I'm curious to know if they discovered that during their highly paid research endeavor that the native tribes, I'm sorry, forgive my French, the indigenous people, who were here when Christopher Columbus showed up, he discovered that the Indians already had some slaves. And on a whole, it was estimated, listen to this, on a whole, it was estimated that 20 to 40% of native populations were slaves, making the Native Americans on par with the slave empires of Greece and Rome. Hmm. What an inconvenient fact that is. I don't, I don't really know what we're going to do with that information now that we've heard it, but let the record show this. And I'm not doing this to be like, well, this is not a what about ism. This is no, you need to understand the totality of what these people are asking and how it's illogical. Let the record show that this Native American tradition of slavery, it was able to continue uninterrupted. And might I add, by colonization, and then by the 18, by 1860, 12.5% of the population in the Indian nations were black slaves, equaling one slave for every eight Indians. So my question is, do, do you plan to bring this poppycock of an appeal to the Native Americans out west, out there on their reservations? I, I'm just, these are just ask, logical questions that I'm asking. Because furthermore, during all of this research that this research team was commissioned to do, did they uncover that throughout the nearly 400 years of the transatlantic slave trade, right? Let's see. We had 12 million. 521,337 Africans, they were taken to be slaves around the entire world. Did, did they learn that only a small minority of that number ever embarked to the areas that would become the United States? I don't, I don't know. Maybe they didn't, they skipped that part of the research. I'll be specific. 305,326 to be exact. That totals to be about 2.4% of that 12 million. That's how many made it here. And no, I'm not done. Mm -mm, these inconvenient facts, they're going to keep on coming. They're going to get told today. 
For comparison, Spain and her territories received 1,061,524 slaves during that same period, representing nearly 8.5%. And France only barely received more than 11%. So that came out to be about 1,381,404. Following France, next was Great Britain with 3,259,441 slaves taken from Africa, meaning that over one quarter, which is 26%, give or take, of all slaves sourced from the African continent were intended for English lands. That, however, pales in comparison to Portugal and Brazil, where, f ooh, five million, 5,848,266 enslaved humans were shipped, and that's nearly 47% of the total number. Even the Netherlands had more stake in the transatlantic slave trade than America did. They, the Netherlands, that 4.4% represented 554,336. So the Netherlands had 554,336 and America had 305,326. So that's 2.4% of the 12 million that made it to this side of the world. And the Netherlands had 4.4%, which is 554,000. 336. So they had double, almost double the amount of slaves that America did. It's interesting though, when I was doing this research, Carter G. Woodson, who's often considered the father of black history, he conducted a close study of the 1830 census data. And he was doing this because he wanted to investigate the rates of free blacks who themselves owned slaves. You mean the blacks on this terra firma own the slaves? Why, yes, some of them did. So let's look into that a little bit. His research revealed that out of those free blacks who were eligible to own slaves, because only heads of households living in states, which could later join the Confederacy, 16% of them owned black slaves. Certain states, however, stand out in their relatively high frequency. Let me name those states for you. You have South Carolina, for instance, saw 43% of eligible free black people own slaves. That's a lot of black people. Like, I think about the percentage of black people that live in my county alone. We're about 56% black. 43% of the eligible free black people own slaves. In Louisiana, it was 40%. In Mississippi, it was 26%. Alabama, 25%. Followed by Georgia at 20%. I was like, wow, this, this, is, this is becoming really complicated when you really kind of dig into the numbers of it all. Because see, we're trying to figure out who do we demand this money from? If you're demanding the white church needs to pay, I say your research hasn't been extensive enough because with over a century of anti-slavery activity, it should come as no surprise to see a dramatic increase in manumissions and widespread emancipation during and immediately following the war for independence. From 1790 to 1810, the number of free Blacks in America increased from 59,466 to 108,395, displaying a growth rate of 82%. The next decade saw that number expand another 72%. So it goes from 108,395 all the way up to 186,000. 446. You guys, <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing. It is to me. I like this kind of stuff. These people, you guys, these people are chasing a boogeyman. They, they're chasing a boogeyman and they are exploiting. 
they are, to me, in my opinion, they're exploiting like legitimate issues in the community that communities in Boston and Chicago and New York and LA and Atlanta and Memphis, like Baltimore, they're exploiting the legitimate issues in the community and then trying to lay the blame on the one demographic because of biblical ignorance or just, I don't know, downright stupidity. Whoever's going to give a listening ear to this nonsense and then voluntarily place a psychological noose around your neck to coerce you into compliance. They want these white people in these white churches, wherever those are, to, to, to just feel guilt, right? You guys, reparations has zero place in the church. Because first of all, how absurd do you sound as a pastor advocating for reparations? I know there's some pro-blackity black ones that do, but they sound absurd too. Because what branch of the federal government bought, traded, or owned slaves? I asked that question. Private citizens owned slaves, but not even states owned slaves. And please let us not forget that there were tons of people, individual private citizens who lost their land as a result of the Civil War and they didn't even own slaves. They didn't even own no slaves. The average slave owner in this country only owned maybe four slaves. I know we, we watch TV and we just think every white person had 40 to 50 slaves on a plantation. Like every white person had a plantation. Every white person had 50 slaves. Every it, Listen, we can't get our history from, from these Hollywood movies. It's, it's time, we gotta go, we gotta pick up some books. And I'm guilty of this too. Uh, a friend of mine who helped me pull these statistics for this show, I had to admit that I was embarrassed when I learned this. And he was like, everything you think you've learned about slavery is a lie. The top 1% of slave owners were the rich ones. There was an elite class of people who owned slaves. And it was less than 5% of white citizens in the antebellum South who owned slaves. So we're gonna examine population statistics, the free Negroes during slavery based on population percentage. I just told you in South Carolina, 43% of the free Negroes owned the slaves. In Louisiana, I just told you it was 40%. Mississippi, what was it, 25%? Make it make sense, Alabama, no, Mississippi, 26%, Alabama, 25%, Georgia, 20%. So if we're going to start begging white folks for some money, particularly the white church, the questions you need to ask yourself is who, 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 who owes what percentage and how much? Why aren't you asking who should pay? Why aren't you asking, well, who was the top slaveholder in U.S. history? It wasn't the government. We know this. And even if you think you know or believe, you know what you think you know about slavery, I want to challenge every believer on here. What you think you know about the American slavery complex industry you, we, we might need to reorient and, and just dig into some books because Christians need to understand the truth about this because now you have these biblical bootleggers trying to convince Christians that they owe or need to pay for the sins of Democrats. Yes, I said that because that's what this is really all about. They want to manipulate Christianity as a ploy to get reparations, and I am not here for it. So if you don't understand from an apologetics and historical perspective how to combat this, then these evil people, they will have you feeling remorseful and sorrowful over something that didn't have anything to do with you. Because then my next question is, are you going to be trying to find and isolate some of those free blacks that own slaves too and ask them for a check? I think not. That doesn't support the narrative. 
They are literally asking you to sign on to stolen valor and this yoke of bondage they're trying to place around your neck. No, no, we need to push back and say no. This is foolish, illogical, and it makes no sense at all. Because let's just say for a moment this $5 billion demand was granted. Do you really think Jamal can't read and you give him a check that that's somehow going to inspire him to be like, you know, when I go to school tomorrow, now that I got my reparations check, I'm going to sit in the front of class and I'm going to pay attention. No, that's not going to help Jamal learn to read. We know money is not the issue because Baltimore spends more money per child than most states. And we already know them kids can't read. It's, it's bad. So money's not the issue. I educate four kids on way less. Like these kids are getting $26,000 per child. That's a lot of money to spend on a child. And, and you still, they, they just, they still can't read. Money is not the issue. This, this is a cultural problem that a cash payment of reparations cannot fix. This trauma, this suffering that you claim that the blacks in, Mich in, in Massachusetts, Boston, Massachusetts are suffering. You really, you really want us to believe that it's because of slavery. You're going to have to help me understand how during Reconstruction, post-Civil War and Reconstruction, why the blacks, I'm sorry, let me, pardon my manners, those were American Negroes. That was a different breed. You, you haven't earned the right to be called American Negro. The American Negroes were flourishing, doing better, families were intact. We were having lots of babies. We wanted to read. We were well-read, well-spoken, well-dressed, well everything, even despite circumstances such as the Democrat-sponsored Jim Crow South. We were doing better without all the government help and programs and handouts and studies. So you convince me. First, I need you to identify these white churches. Which ones? Be more specific. Because if, if I was a white pastor in Massachusetts, I'd be like, yeah, I want all y'all to come, come down to the meet, come down to the church house so we can sit and have a conversation about this. And I would preach till I preach blood, like just sweating blood. I'd preach my heart out and tell those people they need to repent and believe the gospel because their hearts are wicked and dead in sin if they think that the gospel of Christ now demands that I got to do something extra to atone for sin that I didn't even commit. Have you lost your mind? Are you crazy? Are you? You must be. If I don't even know if I have, I have Facebook friends in Pennsylvania. I have Facebook pastors in Pennsylvania. I don't know if I have any in Boston, Massachusetts. But if you're one of my Facebook friends and you're less melanated than me, I wish I wish you would invite every last one of those community, those Marxist, socialistic, money grubbing, covetous, race traders, them fake pastors. You invite them to your church. And after you go pray first, because you don't want to come with this aggression, but I'm not a pastor. So, you know, I'm just saying, invite them to your church. Say, I want to build a bridge. I want to build a bridge and I want to have a conversation. I saw you guys on the news, you know, with your rainbow stoles on and stuff. And I just, I wanted to extend an olive branch and invite you down to the church so we could just lay out the case for this, the white church reparations, give me my money, put the bread in my pocket conversation. I'd invite them down. I'd even buy them lunch. I'd be like, hey, we can, I don't know if they do Chick-fil-A up in the Northeast part of the country. We That's what we do down here, sweet tea and Chick-fil-A and lemonade. Uh, maybe they might do, I don't know, cheese steaks or pizza. What, what's, what do they eat in Boston? I don't know. Whatever the Northern delicacy, what'd you say? Baked beans, okay, whatever it is, whatever your zhuzh is, you, you order some of that. Make sure it's the best, top of the line. Don't spare any expense. And then hand out 
them some Bibles because they gonna need it because they don't read. They're not reading it. So you, you get them, get them a nice Bible on the house, and you walk them through the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, showing them the mystery of this gospel, this glorious gospel that's handed down to us that was prophesied by the prophets and handed down to the apostles by way of Jesus, the chief cornerstone of the church, you know, that universal church that doesn't have a white one or a black one or an Indian one or an Asian one or a Hispanic one. We're just the people of God, that holy spiritual house that's being built up. And you tell them, this is who I am in Christ Jesus. This is, this is what he did for me, his atoning work on the cross for my sin. My ancestors sin if they were in Christ and maybe even some of yours. I want to appeal to you. I'd be like the gospel of Jesus, this dividing wall of hostility that you're trying to build up again. It's already been torn down. It's already torn down. I already have reconciliation with God and my fellow man who is in Christ. You can't place this behavioral noose around my neck and make me walk around with my head down feeling like now I got to I got to cut a check. Now the church got to raise an offering so that we can contribute to this five billion dollar slush fund of wickedness. Absolutely not. I would encourage if you know a, a, a white pastor and then invite like your best black pastor friend so y'all can stand in solidarity. And just hug on them like real tight. Make everybody feel real in a room feel real comfortable. Make it like a microaggression since they like stuff like that, right? Lay it on real thick. And you show them the unity that we have in Christ Jesus. Something that they have no knowledge of, can't even conceptualize. Because the God of this world has blinded their eyes. And you just give the gospel. And then you, yeah, you tell them to repent because they need to repent and believe. Or else they're going to likewise perish. You do that. And then um, ask them how they enjoyed the meal. Offer to pray, but who wants to pray? And you provide a reasoned defense. Get into an apolog apologetic conversation about how they sound retarded. I'm sorry. Maybe that wasn't an appropriate word, but you, you just get into an apologetic conversation about why they sound foolish and stupid. And, 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 and that's it. That's, that's, that's my retort. That's what I would do. I don't, I'm not a pastor. I don't have a church, but if, if I was a man and I had a church in the greater Boston area and I saw this news clip, I'd be like, yay, what an evangelistic opportunity. Let's go on down there and have a conversation with those wonderful, fine people. I'd invite the mayor, Miss Woke Woo. Yes. I'd invite her too. Oh, they'd all, they, yes. Yes, we're gonna, we was we gonna show the love of Christ, but they're gonna they're gonna get some loving correction because you you gotta correct this foolishness with the truth. You can't let this stuff stand. Mm -hmm.